Summer 1995. I had just arrived in the capital and most populous municipality of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Amsterdam. This was my first time being in the city. Everyone in America who'd even been close to marijuana knew about Amsterdam. Hell, Pulp Fiction was only a year old at that point, and I had already seen the film a handful of times. Other than the whole fast food conversation they have in the movie, I didn't know anything about Amsterdam except three things. One, they serve mayonnaise with french fries. <laughs> Two, they have a Van Gogh museum. And three, pot is legal to smoke and ingest. So, as you can imagine, minus the mayo fries, I was excited about Amsterdam. <laughs> there was, however, one major problem. I was an active member of the Sri Chinmoy Center, and being such, I had to live by a very strict diet of no meat, no sex, no drugs, and no rock and roll. My whole reason for being in Amsterdam was that I was touring with a theater group comprised of other members of the Chinmoy Center, performing in a play written by Sri Chinmoy about the life of the Buddha, and I was playing Siddhartha <laughs> and the Buddha. The Buddha. <laughs> we were a mixed cast, so the guys had to travel by an all-white 1977 VW van that not only carried seven guys, but all of our luggage, props, costumes, and scenic elements. I could often be found sitting at the very back with my headphones on while reading the Dharma bums. The three ladies in the cast flew from town to town. Men and women had to be separated always, unless we were directly working on the show or all in a big group for meals and such. We were never allowed to hang out one guy, one gal, never. I was first introduced to the center through one of their divine enterprises, a vegetarian restaurant that was down the block from the used bookstore where I was working offered free meditation classes, so I went. Three months later, I was a member and in New York, well, Queens, for the first time, which is unheard of in the center, but that's a different story. The show originated in New York. We had a five-week run at the One Dream Theater in Soho. We received mixed reviews, the bad ones accusing Tree Chinmoy of being an opportunistic <laughs> sham artist. <laughs> the members of the Chinmoy Center loved the show. In fact, my performance not only gained me notoriety in the center, I'd only been a member a year by that point, so the fact that I was even in New York already was a huge deal. But the night Sri Chinmoy came to see the show, I was invited to his home in Jamaica, Queens, and sat right at his feet while he gave me notes on how to act like I had reached enlightenment. <laughs> at events, Sri Chinmoy would recognize me, call me by name, and check in on me, ask me how I was feeling, while the members around me who never received this attention looked at me amazed. I was an instant star, and that became an interesting personal struggle. How do you remain humble and serene playing the Buddha when you are receiving tons of attention and everyone is constantly telling you how awesome you are as the Buddha? <laughs> I even had people bowing to me and meditating near me at events as if I somehow had actually become enlightened. It was bizarre. But I enjoyed the role, was loving being in New York, and had a lot of fun with my castmates. It was cool to be part of a hit and experience even this low level of celebrity. Someone at some point saw the production and decided they wanted to pay for us to take the show on the road and that the road should end up in Europe. We first went to Seattle with the show, then Victoria, Canada. By this point, for me, the show and the joy of performing in it had begun to wane. <laughs> but the traveling and time spent with my castmates was fun. In Victoria, we all spent a day together walking around shops and having meals together before the show that night. We stopped into a vintage clothing store where several of us found the most ridiculous outfits we could find and tried them on for a laugh. However, it was the moment Sudira stepped out wearing a vintage dress that I realized I was in trouble. Her name at birth was Gabriella, but her spiritual name became Sudira, which meant calm. She was from England, and her parents had been married when they first joined the center. 
As long as you came in as a couple, you could remain a couple, but it was encouraged that you still keep separate even in your home, including sleeping in separate rooms. Sudira and I had become friends, as friendly as the opposite sex can become in the center, by working on a different show my first time in New York. We shared a love of books and music, and over time exposed each other to writers and musicians neither of us had heard of or really listened to prior, but it always remained as friends. It was in the weeks just prior to Victoria, Canada that all of that began to change. Fast forward to over a year later. We were driving back to Seattle after our run in Victoria. I sat crammed in the back seat with three other people listening to the first cassette of Bob Dylan biograph over and over and over again on my Walkman, mostly the song Visions of Johanna. Dylan playing the song on an acoustic guitar with his harmonica rack. The song blew me away. His lyrics so relatable, the story so immediate and true. Ain't it just like the night to play tricks when you're trying to be so quiet? <laughs> For me, the song became the story of someone lonely and in pain, missing the person they once loved. They were struggling with the memory of a love now gone. I eventually came to rename the song Visions of Sudira. The feelings I had developed for Sudira were off limits, not only because she was female, but because of who she was in the center. She was born in the center. She was part of the all-girl singing group that performed for Sri Chinmoy and around the world. She was at his home nightly with all the high-ranking members of the group, and, as far as I knew, she was lesbian, <laughs> or would be if she could be. But somehow, during our time in the weeks before Canada and completely by surprise to us both, all of that changed. She went from being a friend who I genuinely liked and whose company I enjoyed to being the most beautiful thing in the world. She was smart, funny, talented, honest, kind, and had the voice of an angel when she sang. And the British accent, pff, I was fucked. <laughs> but in an effort to suppress and hide my feelings, I wrote about it almost daily in my journal, just so I had somewhere to go with all the confusion and the agony. No one knew. Most of the people on tour were lifers who had known each other since they were kids, so they never suspected anything between Shadira and I. Why would they? Since we were constantly separated unless we were working, there were no behaviors that were suspect. In fact, we weren't even sure of each other until this one day in Frankfurt, Germany. She pulled me aside and she told me she liked me as a friend and had begun to develop feelings for me. But we had to keep it at a friendship level. She then told me in regards to my being a man, after growing up in the center, meeting me, and getting to know me was like finding intelligent life on Mars. <laughs> After this conversation, I started to wonder what prompted her to have this conversation with me, and then it occurred to me. I had left my journals on one of the tables in the theater as we were setting up for the show. I asked her, and sure enough, she had read my journal. My daily account of my feelings for her and the sh constant struggle between being human and wanting to please my guru. I, like Siddhartha, was beneath the Bodhi tree being tempted and I was failing. When you are the only one who knows your thoughts and feelings, it is easy to avoid revealing them to other people. Once the truth is revealed, it becomes a slippery slope of just how much you can get away with. Now that we both knew the feeling was mutual, we had an energy about us and everyone began to feel it. So much so that the director, who was also in the cast and who I believed was a trusted friend, took me aside. We sat in a coffee shop in Oslo and I told him the truth, that I loved her, that I respected her, place in the center and that I had not acted on any of my feelings but I loved her. He made me promise I would not tell anyone else because if word got back to New York the rest of our tour would be canceled and we would be sent back. Also I had to remove myself from Shudira's presence at all times. The only time we could interact was on stage. 
Other than that, he made sure we were under constant supervision or separated. Early on, before anyone suspected, Shadira and I found moments where we could talk and be alone. Once people became involved, we struggled to find moments where we could just connect through a glance or a touch. But as the tour went on, each of these moments became more and more controlled by the others until they were taken from us completely. I was a mess and becoming messier. The fact that I had to hide my truth was manifesting itself as anger and acting out, but mostly I was quiet and sad. There was one moment no one could touch that we kept to ourselves. It was during the show as Siddhartha is meditating with the ascetics and a young girl offers him rice to eat. Siddhartha takes the rice, realizing there's no need to make the body suffer to achieve enlightenment and enrages the ascetics by doing so. Shudira played the young girl and each night of the show she had to place her hand to my mouth feeding me invisible rice. Each night my lips lightly and slowly brushed her fingers as I was eating the rice. Occasionally, I planted an imperceptible kiss. She never once took her hand away or stopped holding it to my mouth. Her hand was always there, fingers always close, willing to accept whatever gesture I was willing to show. It was our only moment, and we took it each night. It was naughty, <laughs> and both loving, yet incredibly sensual. But above all else, was ours. By the time we reached Amsterdam, the entire team knew something was wrong, even if they didn't know exactly what. When tension is present, either good or bad, it is almost impossible not to pick up on it. In this particular situation, the tension ran the gambit, and I was considered the epicenter. So along with the tension came distance. As luck would have it, Amsterdam would prove to be the only time the entire month and a half tour that we had days off. Two, in fact. And I used this time to create any sort of escape from the social prison I was trying to exist in. I visited the Van Gogh Museum purchasing a sketch of a woman titled Sorrow. The image came to represent the weight of not being allowed to be who you are not even being safe to talk about your struggles with someone who knew you and would be compassionate and loving. I was surrounded by those who found me soiled and unworthy of caring. I was no longer their friend or even human. I had become a threat to all they held dear. I was determined to get stoned, so I did. <laughs> I wish I could tell you it was this magical, beautiful experience or even that it was fun, but it wasn't. I was freaked out that I was going to run into someone and get busted. <laughs> I wanted nothing but to speak with Sudira, to hear that she was suffering the same as me so I wouldn't feel so alone, to even just be near her. Then I became angry. These people were supposed to be these loving beings of light spreading joy and understanding across the globe. Instead, they were demanding the suppression of who I was and what I was feeling. Not one of them offered me a safe space or even tried to be compassionate. Not one of them treated me like a friend. It was infuriating. I was being isolated like a diseased criminal for feeling love. Upon returning to New York, I was an immediate outcast. None of the people from the tour would speak to me or even acknowledge me. I never saw Sudira other than big events, and even then, she may as well have been back in Europe. When I finally returned to San Diego, I received a call telling me I had been kicked out of the Sri Chinmoy Center. When I asked why, I was told, for vital reasons. None of the people who had become my friends my family ever spoke to me again. I did see Shadira again years later. I was riding my bike past Fifth Avenue Books in Hillcrest, and there she was on the sidewalk, walking the opposite direction. She was looking at me with a look that was both happy and unsure as I rode past. I hit the brakes and, after a moment, turned to look at her. The rest 
was a moment worthy of the saddest and sweetest movie you have ever seen, and it's mine. This is first time on the vamp stage, James McCulloch.